I invite you to turn two places, one in Matthew chapter 28 and the other in your bulletin because on the back of your bulletin I have some notes. Matthew chapter 28 verse 18 is, is the text for this passage, but... This is a very peculiar or different passage or type of sermon that I'm going to be preaching to you this morning. Before I do so, I want to give three notes to you. One is, I'm going to use the word heathen several times throughout this message because I'm going to quote the author John Patton, the missionary. We don't use that word very often today. It sometimes is derogatory, and it's not used derogatory in any way by John Patton. It meant people who are in places where there is no gospel witness or the church and where Jesus Christ is not proclaimed and where people are lost and in sin and idolatry. I'm going to give a lot I'm going to give some quotes and there are a lot of notes for this and if you ever if if the few of you say hey there was something that really stood out to me you can go to the website and there you will find the manuscript or notes for this message on our church webpage under sermons. And lastly, for years I've wanted to bring Christian biography to the church, meaning the lives of great men and women whom God has used and have inspired and worked in, and he has done a great work. And I pray that this year during this missions conference, God's spirit would inspire us through a missionary biography, that kind of sermon that I'm going to give to you this morning. This isn't the normal way we do sermons, but I trust and believe that God is going to use it during this missions conference. This message is for everyone. Young people, I pray especially that God is going to just light a fire in your heart. Parents, Seniors, everyone in between, that God would light a fire in your heart. John G. Patton wrote, When pleading the cause of the heathen and the claims of Jesus on his followers, I have often been taunted with, You're a, one man, you're a man of one idea. Sometimes, I have thought that this came from the lips of those that do not even have one idea unless it were how to kill time and to save their own skin. But seriously speaking, is it not better to have one good idea and to live for that and to succeed in it than to scatter one's life on many things and leave a mark on none? A man of one idea, the life and lessons of John G. Payton, king of the cannibals. A man of one idea. Some do not even have one idea. One ambition, one passion in their life that they pursue. This should never be true of Christ followers. Our one idea is one person, and that's Jesus Christ. And there is one mission that he has given to us, and it is in your Bibles, and it's in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Look with me there. Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you to the end of the age. You see the command here? See our command? See the two realities surrounding the command that are vital to actually following the command. See the command in verse 19, go make disciples and see the two realities. Reality one, all authority has been given to me. I am in charge. I've been given all, I have all power and authority. Now go make disciples. And then reality number two, I will be with you. Verse 20. Last part of it. This has been called 
the Great Commission. If you've never heard that phrase, I'm, it's because you're not as familiar with maybe missions teaching, but the Great Commission is this call to go make disciples of all nations. The word nations doesn't mean nations like of governments. It means all peoples, all languages, all people groups. This is what Jesus says to us. You're commissioned to go and make disciples, Jesus says. And he says, and by the way, I've been given all authority and power. And that means I send you and I surely will make disciples through you. And you're going to go and I will never leave you or forsake you. Go, church. This is your marching orders. So who is John G. Patton? John Gibson Patton. Let me set the stage for you. In Genesis 11, in the Tower of Babel, God scattered the nations, the peoples, and he scattered them into many tongues, different languages, and, and many, they scattered to the ends of the earth, and some, surprisingly, amazingly, scattered to these islands in the South Pacific, the, Pel the Polynesian Islands, or the South Seas. In 1773, Captain... Cook discovered them, and he named them the New Hebrides because they looked like the, Neb the Hebrides in Scotland. He wrote a lot of things about these islands, and so the, the Western world, the European world saw them, and they had two responses. One was, oh, how beautiful and romantic, untouched tribes of people. They must be a wonderful tribe because they haven't been tainted by Western civilization. How beautiful. And the other was darkness, heathen. No light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They need the gospel. John Williams and his young missionary companion, John Harris, landed on one of those islands, Aromanga, on November 30th, 1839. Within a few minutes of their touching land, both were clubbed to death, and the savages proceeded to cook their bodies and eat them. It's one author writes, thus were the New Hebrides baptized with the blood of martyrs and Christ thereby told the whole Christian world that he claimed these islands for his own. And in 1850, a missionary named Getty from Canada, Nova Scotia, went to the island of Anedom, one of those islands. The gospel took hold the world, the, he sent word back to Scotland and to Canada and other places for more missionaries. There are all these islands. God is at work. And all the pastors in this denomination, the Free Church of Scotland, none answered the call except one man who had not yet been a pastor but been had serving 10 years in some inner city work in Glasgow. His name was John Patton, a thir young 30-something. John Patton was born May 24th in 1824 to James and Janet in Scotland, southern Scotland. He was the eldest of 11 children, and what a happy home, full of love, and godliness. His parents were the root of his great missionary zeal and commitment. And I want to say to you young families or families of all ages, the, the roots of your children in ministry will come from, the, from, from you, your faithfulness, your passion for God, your commitment to the word and to church. They loved the Lord, and they loved the church, and they loved them unto their 11 children. When John was an old man, the, the missionary I'm talking about now, he wrote a big book called, it was his autobiography. It was in three different volumes, and it ended up being about 500 pages. But at the end of his, towards the end of his life, he looks back at, after all his suffering, he looks back at his parents, and he says this, how much my father's prayers at this time of my childhood impressed me, I could never explain, nor could any stranger understand. When on his knees, and all of us kneeling around him in family worship, family devotions, 
He poured out his whole soul with tears for the conversion of the heathen world for the service of Christ. When we rose from our knees, I used to look at the light of my father's face and wish I was like him in spirit, hoping that in answer to his prayers, I might be privileged and prepared to carry the blessed gospel to some portion of the heathen world. He would write later about his dad's prayers, his family life. He said this, Though everything else in religion were by some unthinkable catastrophe to be swept out of my memory or blotted from my understanding, my soul would wander back to those early scenes of my dad in prayer. And I would say, back, say to myself, He walked with God. Why may not I? Oh, may God help us to be that kind of parents or spiritual parents. Some of you are spiritual parents to the children in this church. This inspires me so much as a father, and I hope you as well. It was a happy home. It was a churched life. It was full of faithfulness and joy. Discipline, yes. Instruction, yes. But a joyful, loving discipline. Love from the heart that would Christ in his mission first. The church was so part of their lives. There was a faithfulness in family worship or what they called family worship. It was what we sometimes might call devotions. His parents were not hypocrites. And it came through. They loved the Lord. And it was obvious. I could preach a whole sermon for dads on the life of James Patton, his father, by just the two chapters he writes about his father. So Patton, John Patton, heard the needs of the New Hebrides Islands. He heard that these two men were murdered years ago. It was become legend by then. He hears the message from Getty that there are needs more missionaries. This is what he writes. The Lord kept saying within me, since none is better qualified can be got, rise and offer yourself. Almost overpoweringly was the impulse to answer aloud, here am I, send me. The wail and claims of the heathen were constantly sounding in my ears, and I saw them perishing for a lack of knowledge of the true God and his son Jesus while my own people in Glasgow, in Scotland, had the open Bible, and they had the means of grace with an easy reach, which if they rejected, they did so willingly and to their own peril. But, but people, so he told his church, I, I think God's calling me to go to the New Hebride Islands. I may never come back. The last people that were there, some of the people that were there most recently were killed. And some said, but John... John, you'll be eaten by cannibals if you go. Remember the two Scottish missionaries who went just 15 years before? Here's his response to the, the gentleman that said that to him. Mr. Dixon, you are advanced in years now, and your own prospect is soon to be laid in the grave, there to be eaten by worms. I confess to you that if I can but live and die serving and honoring the Lord Jesus... It, may, it will make no difference to me whether I'm eaten by cannibals or by worms. And in the great day, my resurrection body will rise as fair as yours in the likeness of our Redeemer. What courage and what zeal, what energy. So John takes his 19-year-old bride. He kind of just skips over the story. He, he meets somebody. He gets married to a 19-year-old Mary He's 34, and they sail for Australia, and then 1,400 more miles to the island of Tana. And for four years, he labors on this island called Tana. And it was sowing in tears. Speaking of the spiritual condition of the inhabitants of the island, he says, their whole worship on this island was one of slavish fear they had all these different idols and gods and spirits they worshipped. So far as I could learn, they had no idea of a God of mercy and of grace. 
And he says the depths of Satan outlined in the chapter of Romans 1 were uncovered there before my eyes daily without veil and without excuse I would see in the people. My first impressions of these people drove me to the verge of utter despair. On beholding these natives in their paint and nakedness and misery, my heart was full of both hitter, horror and pity. Had I given up my much beloved work in Scotland, he thought, with so many del delightful associations to consecrate my life to these degraded creatures, nakedness, violence, Violence towards the missionaries, violence towards one another. There was always constant fights and wars, abortion, infanticide, the killing of their babies, especially daughters. Widow strangling was a common practice. A man dies, oh, let's kill the widow so that the widow can go help him in the afterlife. So they would strangle widows. There was wife murder. She doesn't please me. Boom, I'm going to knock her off. Theft, no morality. And then to make things worse, there was the abuse of the white man, the the. The sandalwood traders from Europe would come because they would get sandalwood furniture from these islands, and they made life miserable for the missionaries. They, they, would, they would bribe the natives on the land, the islanders, and say, if you kick them off or kill these missionaries, we'll give you more trade goods. It, it, was, it was terrible. Threats of life constantly. He, he would describe times where he would walk around for an entire day doing his jobs, taking care of the mission, and islanders would follow them with a musket aimed at their head, about to kill them. Malaria, measles brought by the traitors. Fourteen times John Patton had severe fever and illness. And only months after arriving in 1859, his wife, on March 3rd, 1859, dies of malaria. He writes, To crown my sorrows and complete my loneliness, the dear baby boy that she just bore, that we named after Peter, my, her father, was taken from me after one week's sickness on the 20th of March. So he loses his wife and has to bury her. He loses a few weeks later, a week later, his son Peter and buries him. He says, let all those who have passed through any similar darkness as of midnight feel for me. As for others, it would be more than vain to try to paint my sorrows. So he's stunned by this dreadful loss. He's sitting there. He, he's overwhelmed. He says, but I was never forsaken. The ever merciful Lord sustained me. People pled with him, you should leave the island, go recover. And he said, no, if I leave, I may never be able to get back on the island. He says, the ever merciful Lord sustained me to lay the precious dust of my beloved ones in the same quiet grave. He dug his, the graves of his own wife and daughter. He did it with his own hands. And he had to sleep by the graves so that they didn't dig him up and eat them. He writes real boldly as he pens these words in his autobiography years later. He took a lot of journals. Whosoever, whenever Tana turns to the Lord, that's this island, and is one for Christ, men in after days will find the memory of that spot, the spot of the grave, still green, where the ceaseless prayers and tears I claimed that land for God in which I buried my dead with faith and hope. Amen. So after laboring for many years, well, for a few more years, for four years, having learned the language, one of the missionaries on the island, Mr. Johnson, he, he, f he suffers a blow from one of the islanders and then dies a little way. A little time after that, he was killed. He has to flee from his house. His house is burned. He loses every possession except his journals and some of his translations of his Bible. He has a few bright spots on that island. A conversion of a few of the islanders. A disciple named Abraham. 
I don't have time to talk to you about Abraham. Abraham, he tells so fondly, he was from an, a, another island but was a new convert. He has, and then his, his faithful dog, Kalutha, a guard dog, a warning dog, he regularly tells about old Kalutha. One chief who was saved on that island during that time. And then stood up for John Patton. And his life, this chief's life was constantly threatened because of his faithfulness to Christ. He writes this, Missy, and that's what they would call John Patton, the missionary. Missy, when I see them thirsting for my blood, I just see myself when the missionary first came to the island. I desired to murder him as they now desire to kill me. Had he stayed away for such danger, I would have remained heathen. But he came and continued coming to teach us till by the grace of God, I was changed to what I am. Now the same God has changed me to this. Now the same God that has changed me to this can change this poor Tannese to love and serve him. It was a painful four years in Tana, and they left. They left through providence. They felt like God was leading them to, to escape for their life for a season with the hope to come back. It was 1862. John fled the island. This is just to kind of set the tone or set the context. In 1862, the American Civil War is going on. John fled the island after sticking it out for this long time. It felt like a defeat. No missionaries are left on the island. No church is left on the island. Feels like a failure. So what does he do? He goes to Australia to heal with his illnesses, to recover. And he spends a year there. Visit. He didn't know anybody when he gets to Australia. Had hardly any contacts. Contacts. And over the next year, he visits probably 400 locations, 400 churches or meeting places, and he tells them about the work of the New Hebrides, and people give and start to give like crazy. He goes to Sunday schools, and he tells them, and he actually starts this mission of, of a, mission, uh, a mission shipping company, which is to build a ship in order to send supplies and missionaries to these islands called the Dayspring. And he tells the children, give pennies and you'll buy a share of that ship for the sake of the gospel. And he raises just an amazing amount of money. He goes back to Scotland and God used him to almost bring a mini revival in Scotland as he shares the story of God's work in spite of all the defeat. And this is astounding. In his little denomination, I think it's called the Free Church of Scotland, a small denomination at that time, it says that as he called people to give to the missions, as well as to go as missionaries, he says one in every six ordained minister in Scotland in that denomination felt the call to leave their work and to go and become missionaries of the cross elsewhere. <laughs> Imagine that. And, and he writes this. He says, so, so would that, is the result of that, Man, is he kind of crippling the church? Is he crippling the church back home to help the church in the New Hebrides? He says, oh, no, not at all. He says, Near did, he says, nor did the dear old church thus cripple herself. On the contrary, her zeal for missions accompanied, if not caused, unwant, un, unexpected prosperity at home. New waves of generosity passed over the hearts of people. Debts that had burdened the churches and the buildings were just washed away with generosity as God was starting to do a work. This is, a, I think, a principle for our church and for any church, friends, that it is a fixed point in the faith of every missionary that the more any church or congregation, I'm quoting John Patton, any the, that the, the faith of every that more any church or congregation interests itself in the lost in the heathen, the more it will be blessed and pot, prospered at home. One of the surest signs of life is the effort of the church to spread the gospel all over the world. These churches, he writes, committed themselves never to withdraw, as it were, till these islands were occupied. With Jesus. So, 
He goes in 1866. He heads back to the islands with his new wife, Margaret. He, he meets another wife, another lady, says, will you go back with me? She says, yes. He marries her. He goes back to, he wants to go back to the island of Tana where he'd been, but the consensus of the missionaries in that area said, you know, it's too dangerous right now. Go to this other island. It was called Aniwa. It was a smaller island, less violent, but still very unreached. They're violent. They're dishonest. They're cannibals. He gets there. He thinks things are going to go pretty good. And he, he's trying to build up a new house to establish for a long time. And he finds he's learned from the past where and where not to build, depending for, the, for malaria. And they say, you should build here. And he said, oh, it looks pretty good. But the reality is they had bad motives. The natives said, if he builds there, that's an old burial ground. There's a lot of bones there. And when he uncovers those bones, our gods will punish this missionary family and kill them. And then they'll be left there. And then we'll take all the goods they brought here. That was their motive. That's what they told them after the fact. So as they were digging, building the foundation of this house, they discover the bones. And Patton says to some of them, why are there bones here? And their response was, we are not Tana men. We do not eat the bones. And the point was, well, we eat the flesh. We just don't eat the bones like some others do. That just says, tells you what kind of culture they were in. For the next 15 years, they serve. They teach. They learn the language. They put it into writing. His wife was awesome, Margaret. He doesn't say much in his autobiography, but she wrote letters back home, back home, over and over again. And, and they, they were eventually published in a book called Letters from the South Seas by Margaret pa Patton. A turning point came when he decided to sink a well. They're on this, like, volcanic island, small. There's no fresh water on the island. The only fresh water they get is from the rains. And when it doesn't rain... Or if it dries up, they're in trouble. They just have salt water surrounding them. And, and so he thinks, I'm going to try to sink a well. They'd never heard of something like sinking a well, digging a well. And so he starts to do it. And the, the islanders mock him. They laugh at him. What are you talking about? It doesn't rain from the ground. It only rains from above. And all they've ever known of fresh water is rain. It's rainwater. So he digs and digs. He gets down to about 30 feet and he's almost, is this going to happen? Oh, God, please give me water. Please give me water. Is there even water, fresh water on this small island? And it came, and they were shocked. A miracle, rain coming up from below, and an influential chief was converted at this time. This became a turning point in the work on Aniwa. In fact, it was so powerful that this chief became such a key person in this in, this, in the work of God on Aniwa, he gave a sermon right then and there. This is, he recorded his words. He, so the chief, he says, So I, your chief, he said to all those that had gathered, do now firmly believe that when I die, I shall then see the invisible Jehovah God with my soul, as Missy tells you, not less surely than I have seen the rain from the earth beneath, from this day, my people, I must worship the God who has opened up the well and who fills us with rain from below. He says, let us get rid of all our idols. Let's burn them. And let us be taught by the Missy how to serve the God who can hear, the Jehovah who gave us this well and who gave who will give us every other blessing, for he sent his son Jesus to die for us and to bring us to heaven. This is what the Missy has been telling us ever since he landed on Aniwa. We laughed at him, but now we believe him. The Jehovah God has sent us rain from earth. Why should he not also send us his son from heaven? And so for the next dozen years, he trained, he discipled, he baptized. Oh, he was careful not to just quickly, oh, you're going to trust Jesus here, get a baptism. He, he taught them. He wanted to make sure that it was a real profession of faith. And they got rid of their idols and they were serving the true living God. He translated books, uh, the Bible for them. He put that into a written language for the first time. He, I mean, he established 
churches and there was the Lord's Day on Sunday was like the best day of the week for everyone there. The whole island would worship and feast and praise the Lord and sing and be taught the word of God. Families were saved and they would make it central to their lives to have family devotions and worships in every home on this island. I mean, it was like a revival on this island. It is the work, clear work of God. Orphanages were started the culture, the morality, everything was changing. He, speaking of worship, this is years later. He says this, when I, went, when I returned to so-called civilization, Europe, England, and saw how the Lord's Day was abused in white Christendom, my soul longed after the holy Lord's Days of Aniwa. Patton writes, I claimed Aniwa for Jesus. And by the grace of God, Aniwa now worships at the Savior's feet. Patton will labor for the islands and especially Aniwa for the next 41 years, 14 years there, and then going back and forth and helping the church. He'd go back to England and Scotland and Europe to America to support missionaries. He met two presidents of the United States because they wanted to meet him. He would have a message, a sermon regularly saying, come over and help us. That's a message to us. Come over and help. The McPhail Fosses, our, our missionaries. Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher in England, said, called him the king of the cannibals. And yet he knew that there's only one king of the cannibals, and that's Jesus Christ who rescues cannibals and saves them. In 1880, his brother, James, pled with him. You need to put this into writing. You need to write about your journeys. You had journals. And so he, he started and wrote an autobiography that has made such a difference in the mission world and in the church. Before his death, more than 25 of the 30 inhabited islands had the gospel established in those islands. He writes towards the end of his autobiography, there are still four or five centers of heathenism untouched in these islands. When God sends missionaries for these, it will be only a question of time and prayer and pain till the new Hebrides in all their babble tongues shall be heard singing the praises of the redeeming love. May my blessed Savior spare me to see the full dawn, if not perfect noon of that happy day. What a life. What a ministry. And so in conclusion, I want to give you three lessons from the life of John Patton. And they're from the scripture text that I read at the beginning. Three inspiring lessons from the life and labors of John Patton. All three from this text. The command and the two realities. And so the first one is this. It's from the scripture. Go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Oh, brothers and sisters, faith, church, Pastor Daniel, all of us, I pray that our hearts would just be overwhelmed with this calling. This calling here in this community and this calling to all nations. And so here is the first lesson. Number one, John Patton had a joyful obsession with the great commission of Christ. And so should we. I pray that, please pray, make this a prayer. John Patton... God, would you give us a joyful obsession with the Great Commission, with Christ and the Great Commission of Christ? Please, God. Did you see this so far? It started from John's home. When, his, when he went to his parents and said, Mom and Dad, I think I'm called to the New Hebrides Islands. I may never come back with my bride. He never came back with his bride at that time. You know what they said to him? When everybody else was saying, no, you should, you're wasting your life, your talent, you should stay in Scotland. You're too skilled for that. Mom and dad said this, we didn't want to bias you, but we want to tell you why we praise God for this decision to which we have, you've been led. Your father's heart was set upon being a minister, but other claims forced him to give it up. When you were given to them, your father and mother laid you on the altar, our firstborn. To be consecrated, if God saw fit, to be a missionary of the cross. And it has been our constant prayer that you might be prepared, qualified, 
and led to this very decision. And we pray with all our heart that the Lord may accept your offering, long spare you, and give you many souls for the, from the heathen world for your hire. Isn't that amazing? His wife had this obsession for the gospel even though she died just months into this mission. She writes back to home and writes to mom and says this, you must not think that I regret coming here and leaving my mother. If I had the same thing to do over again, I would do it with more, far more pleasure. Yes, with all my heart. Oh no, I do not regret leaving home and friends. Though at this time I feel it, feel it keenly. John's passion was to go make disciples. And some would say, but John, there are so many people dying, living and dying right at your doorstep. They're going to hell. They need the gospel. They're heathen too. What do you say about that? And he said, well, I know that's true. And it's an appalling fact. But I observe that people that make that objection are neglecting the heathen themselves. And so the objection is from them lost, loses all its power. They go ungrudgingly, spending more on fashionable party at dinner and tea, on concert and ball or theater, or all these displays with worldly selfish indulgences. They spend 10 times, perhaps in a single day on those luxuries, than a whole year giving to the cause of missions. So I don't listen to those arguments because this people in these far off lands have no gospel light. No wisdom. No, no light of the gospel in the church. I pity the people at home who are such poor stewards of their resources. Listen to his passion, his obsession. My heart bleeds for the heathen. And I long to see a teacher for every tribe and missionary for every island of the New Hebrides. The hope is still burns that I may witness it. And then I would gladly rest. He says, towards the end of his book, Oh, that I had my life to begin again. I would consecrate it anew to Jesus in seeking the conversion of the remaining cannibals on the New Hebrides. But since that may not be, may, I, may he help me to use every moment and every power still left to me to carry forward to the uttermost that beloved work. Oh, brothers and sisters, faith church, do we have an ounce of that type of obsession? Do we have that for the lost neighbor that you have? Do you have that for those that you work with? Do you have that in your home, an obsession for Christ and his mission of making disciples? Oh, that we would see this directory of, of names, and we would start to take these names upon our hearts and pray and pray and give and start to ask God, are you calling me to do more? And I would say the answer is yes. God, you call us to do more, to let our life count for eternity, both in mission here at the local church, caring for our neighbors, caring for the lost in our region, and for those that do not have the same opportunities just like John had. John, passion. May he ha we have the same passion. He ends, comes close to ending his biography. He has a lot of like coming close to ending the book. And he says here, here I lay down my pen. Let me record my immovable conviction that this is the noblest service, meaning missions, in which any human being can spend or be spent. And that if God gave me my, back my life to be lived over again, I would not with a quiver of hesitation lay it, I would lay it on the altar again and then I would use it for similar ministries of love, especially among those who have never heard the name of Jesus. He says, I deeply rejoice. It is my prayer. It is my burden when I breathe the prayer that it, it may please the Lord to turn the hearts of my children to the mission field. Oh, that my children would go and take up the great cause. His son Frank would spend his life in the New Hebrides Islands, wrote a book about missionaries into the South Seas. With this obsession for Christ and his mission, Pat knew this. He knew, 
he knew that God was about to go and make disciples of all nations. So he went. Oh Lord, would you give us as a church, give me as a pastor, give us as a congregation, give those that are watching, give us a joyful obsession with Christ and his commission. Forgive us for not having that. Inspire us through this life. The second thing I want you to see is found when Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. When Jesus said that, here's the second lesson. John Patton had a living confidence in the authority and power of Christ. And so should we. He had a living passion or confidence in the authority and power of Christ. And, and where I want you, yes, he had, he had a confidence in God's authority and power to help him, deliver him, protect him. But I want you to see, he went to these islands. And he said, I need God's power to do what I could never do. Here are these islanders, these natives, what were savages to him. And they were murdering and naked. And he said, I need you to change them. Guys, isn't that what it is with our lives when we parent children, when we care for our grandchildren, when we care for our neighbors? Oh, God. I need you to convert them. And he writes about conversion here and he says, it is God that changes. He says, when I have read about the shallow objections of people, he calls them irreligious scribblers and talkers, and they hint about how there really is no conversions on the mission field. You know, but he says, oh, how my heart has yearned to take those skeptics and to plant them just one week on the island with the natural man all around them in the person of cannibal and heathen and with one spiritual man, a new convert like Abraham, seeing how he nurses and feeds them and saves them for the love of Christ. He, he saw the power of conversion in such real ways. The dark places of the earth are full of the habitations of horrid cruelty, he writes. To have actually lived among the heathen and seen their life gives a man a new appreciation of the power and of the gospel, even where its influence is only very imperfectly allowed to guide our passions. Oh, what it will be like when all men in all nations love and serve the glorious Redeemer. Hmm. I pray that, do we have this courage and confidence that God can work in our church? Do you have a list of people you pray for who are lost? Do you believe in God's converting power? Do you pray like you believe that? Do you pray for your children and your grandchildren? Do you pray for the people in your lives? Are you looking for people in your lives to pray for, to care for their soul, that God could change them from darkness to light? What he says about them, God did a work in them and he can do a work in those around us. Do we really believe, oh, that God would give me more as a pastor, give you as a member, give us a passion and a living confidence that Jesus has authority, Jesus has power, and he has sent us to go make disciples. If that's the case, he's going to accomplish that purpose. Patton believed that and so should we. Lastly, Jesus ends the Great Commission and he says, Behold, or lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Oh, I, I wish I had time to just tell you story after story of Patton's near escapes and God protecting and blessing him. John Patton, this is number three, John Patton was, had a comforting awareness of the presence of Christ and so should we. I pray that we will. I pray that Dee Bellows in the hospital with her husband Mike with a terrible accident this week will. I pray that you will this week in this life. You will grow to understand a comforting awareness of the presence of Christ like John Patton grew. As we, call, we follow the great commission that he has called us to, he knew his God and he enjoyed the presence of that God who is saying, I will be with you. I'm going. He writes this, when when clubs were raised against us to kill us, he tells this story, they encircled us in a deadly ring. So imagine, this is on Tana. They're surrounding him to kill him. 
And one kept urging another to strike the first blow or fire the first shot with the musket. And my heart arose up in the Lord Jesus. I saw Jesus watching all of the scene. My peace came back to me like a wave from God. I realized that I was immortal till my master's work was done. The assurance came to me as like a voice from heaven. He says, I knew that not one killing stone, not one blow, not one arrow, one, not one throw would come without the permission of Jesus Christ, who is all power in heaven and on earth. He rules all nature, all inanimate and animate objects, and he resta- restrains even the savage of the South Sea. He goes on to say, Yet I could never say that on some occasions I wasn't afraid. My knees were trembling, he writes. But I was never left without hearing the promise in all its consoling and supporting power coming up through the darkness and anguish. Lo, I am with you always. I'm with you, John. Oh, I pray that we'd feel that way. Do we live in such a radical way that we need to trust in God's sovereign power? Or we just surround ourselves with such comforts that our chief obsession in life is to keep ourselves safe, keep ourselves comfortable and financially secure. But no, to live on an invisible God who he knows he's immortal until God's done with him. He says, the types of things that I experienced without God's abiding consci- without the abiding consciousness of God's presence and power, nothing in the else in the world could have preserved me from losing my mind and reason. He said, These words kept coming to me. Lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. They became so real that it would would not have startled me if like when Stephen, I gazed up and saw the Lord looking down. Oh, the bliss of living and enduring as seeing him who is invisible. One one, One last story. He was... He had to escape. His house was burned. He's running. And they, they, some friends advise him, climb up into this chestnut tree, hide out for the night. You ever spent the night in a tree because you're running for your life? He goes up there. He lays in the tree. His wife's dead. He's laying up there. And he said, I sat there among the branches as safe in the arms of Jesus. Never in all my sorrows did my Lord draw nearer to me. Then when the moonlight flickered against the chestnut leaves and the night air played on my throbbing brow as I told all of my heart to him, alone yet not alone, if it be to glorify my God, I will not begrudge to spend many nights alone in such a tree, to feel my Savior's spiritual presence, to enjoy his consoling fellowship. If thus thrown back upon your own soul, he says the reader, all alone in the midnight in the bush in the very embrace of death itself, do you have a friend like this? Oh, that God would speak his word to us, Faith Church, through the testimony of this servant, John Patton. May he take and burn on our hearts the mission and great commission to take the word of God, the gospel, make disciples of all nations. May God give us this obsession. May he help us to know him so dearly and intimately that we believe his power. We would believe his power at Faith Church and in our community and in our homes. And we would share the gospel and we'd pray like we believe he has all authority. And may we live in his presence and power. I think a great way to end this is to end the way he ended his book. He says this to the reader. Reader, fare thee well. You've read this long book. Fare thee well. You listen to this long message. Thou hast accompanied me, not without some little profit, I trust, and not without noting many things that lead you to bless the Lord God, in whose honor these pages have been written. In your life and in mine, there is at least one last chapter One final scene awaiting us. God our Father knows where and how by His grace I will live out that chapter. I will pass through that scene. In the faith and in the hope of Jesus who has sustained me from childhood until now. As you close this book, 
Go before your Savior and pledge yourself upon your knees by His help and sympathy to do the same. And let me meet you. And let us commune with each other again in the presence and glory of the Redeemer. Let's pray. Father, oh, I pray that you would use the testimony of this missionary and of this servant of God. I pray that you would use the marching orders of our Lord Jesus Christ who says to go and make disciples. And I pray that we would. I pray, God, that in the coming days and weeks, you would stir in our hearts a deeper zeal and energy and hope, belief in your goodness and love and your help, your power. Your Give us, help our hearts to bleed for the people of Cameroon and India and Afghanistan or other countries that you put in our hearts and bring across the lives of our church. Oh, God, please help us.